Yo, 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 welcome back to the Further Your Lifestyle podcast, conversations on lifestyle, passions, and hustles. My name's Chris Furlong, I am your host, and I am once again super thrilled to be back here having the conversation with you. But I'm even more excited to introduce you to our guest this week, and that is Sharon Rolfe. Now, Sharon, she is known as the Queen of Courage, a retirement coach helping people find their essence, more so helping retirees find their inner spark. But at the same time, she is encouraging anyone and empowering anyone that is willing to listen to help them find success, but also the place in which you fit in with your passion, your purpose, and where you can make a difference. Now, in this episode, we do dive into that journey of how to be seen and how to avoid going through life and feeling that you're invisible, how to win at life, and how to remove that idea of just going to work to retire, but to be living with purpose and passion, but also working with passion and purpose. So whether you are retired, beginning your career, or you're somewhere in the middle, you shouldn't be bouncing off walls trying to figure out who you are, what you love, or where your passion and purpose is. And in this conversation, that's what we get into. That's what we discuss. And I think there's some great value here to take away, whether you are at the start, the middle, or at the end of that journey and working career. But it's never too late to start something that you're passionate or really, really love. So however you like to listen, get comfortable, get cozy. We are on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We are on YouTube for the video experience as well. So however you like to listen, get cozy, and let's jump into it. Welcome, Sharon, to the Further Your Lifestyle podcast. I'm so thrilled to have you here and to join us. Um, yeah, how are you doing this morning? Uh, I am doing good. I just came in from my walk. So, you know, life is good. I got to pet a couple dogs. That's my highlight of my walk. <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's always nice. It's nice getting out and seeing all the puppies and all the, uh, all the other dogs. There's a nice little walk that I, I take in the city with my girlfriend and we call it the, the puppy trail because that's, that's where people are allowed to take their dogs, right? And it's just you know, a nice 20 minutes of just a lot of excitement and fun and cuteness. That's where I get my love. <laughs> uh, I love it. It's great. We'll take what we can get, right? So look, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to have you here. And, you know, there's, there's a lot about you, which I'm, I'm keen to get into. But, you know, is, I guess as a quick overview, you know, you're a retirement coach and you've, you've, you've done the nine to five. You're now past that. You're retired and you're helping other people, I guess, finding their spark. But I want to. I want you to tell the people who you are, what you're all about, and and then we'll, we'll dive into the deeper stuff. So yeah, who are you, and what are you all about? Well, I am Sharon Rolf. I live north of Seattle, Washington. I've actually been to Australia with a choir tour and got to learn the fair dinkum and dinky die terms. <laughs> My favorite day was in uh, Brisbane where we body surfed and well, wow. I guess that was at the Gold Coast, but um, I uh, was uh, floating on a pool in front of uh, some, this guy's house that was hosting us and there was a full moon and wow. water and moon is just magical to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds lovely. Jeepers. Tough. It would it sounds so that was part of the, when you came here for part of the choir or was that, was that another time as well? That was with the choir. So I, you know, it's time to come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully once things have passed and everything's kind of calmed down, yeah, we'll be able to open up and it would, it'd be great. I mean, there's so many people that I've met doing all these podcasts that I want to, I kind of want to meet. So uh, back, back to you. So retirement coach, what, what does that even mean? Right. You know, your background, you have worked a nine to five. Um, but right now at this point in time, you know, you've got Obviously, you've got a, a skill of trades that you've done in the past, but now you're a retirement coach. So setting the scene for that, how does one even become a retirement coach? Because that, that's, you know, for you to go then tell people, what should you be doing in your retirement? How do you even get there? Let, let's, let's quickly ch chat on that so people can understand what is it even that you're doing? Well, the thing that makes me most unique is that I'm a behavioral scientist. So all those facts and figures that all those financial planners work with you on, I don't care a thing about that, <laughs> except I need to increase what, I, what I'm uh, living on, I guess, uh, <laughs> would be a dream. <laughs> yeah. But um, I, I want, there's, a, there's becoming this holistic retirement planning now where you think about your values, uh, creating a new purpose, um, thinking about what would you like your day to look like once you're retired. And um, sometimes people have a struggle with um, thinking that since they don't have a business card anymore, it's like, yep. who am I without uh, a role or task or team? 
you don't often realize how much your job gives you value. You've got yeah. a, a problem to solve. You've got things to do that the boss is looking for. When I first retired, I actually started coaching school the week before because I had uh, done a convention here in town. And uh, my director said, always have something to go next, go to next. Yep. You know, have, you know, once you stop and, and you kind of, tend to go into a little bit of depression with nothing to look forward to. So <clears throat> I looked forward to retirement with coaching school because it was a natural progression of my behavioral science. Yep. And um, my last job, I was empowering people to take problem solving down to the lowest level. And um, I still feel like I'm doing that because um, the other thing that they don't tell us is you're the boss now in retirement. That's right. <clears throat> I'm the boss. <laughs> you know, so I, after I um, got the social security and Medicare and all that stuff taken care of, I started bouncing off the walls. How, how do I know if I'm productive? I, you know, wasting time is not one of the things I like to do. So um, I had made a wall hanging of my essence statement and the essence statement we we created the first weekend of class. Okay. And as I read that as a statement, I realized it centered me. Every day felt good, right? You know, when I was living from my essence. And so I want to do that for everybody that has a struggle in retirement. Yeah. <clears throat> I've never married and never had kids. So um, for single people, um, especially living alone. Yeah. Um, you don't have kids. Come to my thing over here, Grandma. Come to my thing. Over, <laughs> come to my graduation. All, all that's out there. Yeah. So you actually have to be determined to right. do your own socializing and put it on the calendar and and uh, make sure you're getting out of the house on purpose so you're yeah. socializing. Yeah, there was a guy I went, I, I one of the first things I did with to find clients was do a, a what do I want to do in retirement workshop at the senior centers. And uh, I went up here to the community where I was born. And um, I had a few minutes before I had to be there. And so I went to a grocery store. And here I saw a man sitting in his pickup out in the parking lot. And I thought, well, I'm glad he's out of the house. But if this is his only social thing for the day, yeah, it kind of makes me sad. So I was, I had real mixed feelings about he was sort of being social, but um, um, having people to talk to keeps us healthy. It keeps us uh, our healthcare costs down, and it tends to add years to our life. That's it, and that that's what you want, especially going into retirement. But there's there's a lot there that I want to kind of just kind of um, tap into. So. Taking a step back, so leading up to retirement, um, you know, you said you're a behavioral scientist um, and you have been working, uh, you know, helping people do problem solving. And that, that's really been your career for a, for a long period of time. So the first thing I want to try to kind of clarify for the audience then is, so going for your working career then, do you think there's times during that where maybe it's almost a reflection of what you need to be thinking going into retirement of you know is there things there where you need to be checking is this purposeful work for me because sometimes we we do work and we're just doing work for the sake of it which is why when we go into retirement we feel like we're stripped away from purpose but at the same time do you think while doing your work there is that reality check that needs to happen around well is this really the stuff I want to be doing while I'm working the you know the nine to five or, or whatnot well, there's a couple different ways I could go on answering that because um, one of the things that um, uh, I think it was just three, four months after I retired, I heard a, uh, Andy Shaw from the UK do a webinar on mental strength, okay. not mental health, mental strength. And um, he said, well, when you're facing a tough situation and you don't feel like you have quite what you would like to have as far yeah. as confidence and recall a warm memory and it will give you that backbone and that confidence that you need going into something that's kind of scary. And he had given um, a story of he'd always wanted to learn to fly. And so his warm memory is 
is a picture of his a son in the back seat of the plane that he was flying. That made him feel so good. And um, I, a couple of weeks later, I thought, why just have one more memory? Why not yeah. have, see how many I could come up with? And the shock was half of the things on that list were in front of people. Yeah. Already retired. And then I learned that. Yeah. <laughs> Am I, was I in the wrong career? And and so like when I did Toastmasters in um, Dale Carnegie courses, that's in front of people, you know, I think I did um, Toastmasters, well, yeah, I went to the Toastmasters conference. Um, seems like there was an, well, I've, this this conference that I led, I actually chaired it one year. Okay. And so, okay. Um, but another thing that happened um, that sometimes people struggle with is being um feeling invisible in retirement and yeah. I, this is a little bit of a sidebar to your question but i i took this hat into the first day of coaching school or well, i talked about it first day and they invited me to bring it in the next day yep and i was going to wear it to a birthday party the next weekend and uh when i took in the hat the next day i took not only one but five or six of them and it's kind of been symbolic of, uh, of uh, my becoming visible and yep. invisible. I was the middle of five and being um, the middle and not wanting to rock the boat because of abuse that was happening. I, um, I just want to make good grades and, you know, yeah. uh, be, be obedient and, and um, be invisible. But now it's like i'm i'm becoming influential and i'm being uh, i'm willing to be seen and i'm hoping to go on a book tour here soon with my oh yes fresh courage in retirement and i walk three people through the process of finding their own purpose in retirement and from more of the behavioral science kind of perspective yeah it's not dry i give you lots of ideas because i think curiosity keeps us young and um, I'm trying to help you think of all the possibilities that could be for you. That's it. Because your unique purpose is different than everybody else's. 100%. No, that, that's really good, right? And <clears throat> I think, unfortunately, a lot of the time it takes us to go through an experience or, you know, I mean, obviously I'm not retired, but going through whether you've worked for 10 years and then you go through it and you realize, oh, what was I doing? Or I didn't do any of this. And sometimes it can be regret, right? And the idea is that you don't want to be having to wait till you retire to then be trying to fix things. Not saying that you can't, but you know, the idea is what you're trying to do is not just help people transition to retirement to have a purposeful life, but you know, why, why start when you're retired, when you can start to put those things in, into place before retirement, retirement, right? And you, you touched on the essence statement. So what is an essence statement? Um, what is your essence statement? And what, what does that even mean? Like for people that have no understanding, uh, let, let, let's touch on that. <clears throat> well, I love to talk about essence because um, I, I have felt for two or three years that heaven wants to come to earth. And when I'm living from my essence, the best in me, what we could call your inner spark or uh, your DNA. Yep. <clears throat> You know, you were born with it. Um, things just feel right, feel good when you're living from your uniqueness. Yep. So my essence statement, um, I, I had um, been in Dallas, Texas for um, art fair. May, May, the first week of May, they have an art fair. And um, this booth in the back, um, South 40, had, um, had a geometry turn, teacher turned um <clears throat> jeweler okay. and i love <clears throat> unique things just like chris is unique you know i'm unique well i love unique jewelry too and um when i put on this guy's rings um something st stirred in my stomach and i what is going on i took them off and put them back on and i felt that stirring in my stomach again and i never had experience like that but i yeah. use that to describe um then myself at my job currently mm. being kind of a project manager how was i contributing how was i reliable how was i colorful how was i valuable <laughs> so 
my essence statement starts with I am precious jewel of wisdom. Wow. I'm a colorful collaborator, motivator, and learner. I'm tranquil, authentic, and pure inspirer. I light fires. I want to light your fire. <laughs> That's it. But it, it's, it's really beautiful that, you know, you've kind of gone to somewhere, you've seen something, and it's just giving you this great analogy or, or a wake-up moment of making you feel like, oh, that's how I want to feel. That's how I want to be. Because, I mean, that's exactly how a jewel is, right? It shines. It makes people feel special. It makes people feel pure or beautiful. And so so for you to, to do that transition of actually, okay, yes, you've seen the jewel. It's helped spark something into you, but then actually going around and, and making that essence statement come to life. Because obviously, you know, we can say positive words about ourselves. <clears throat> we can talk all the talk, but how do we actually put that into practice? Like, because, you know, whether you're taking all of that, because there's quite a lot of words in that essence statement, but how, how do we actually put that into action? And then how would someone even find their essence statement? Well, the how is my service to you, <laughs> but the what and why, um, the, the reality of your essence statement, um, once I guess for me, it kind of happened naturally because I was reading and reminding myself yep. on a daily basis, uh, two, three times a day and um, <clears throat> realizing, <clears throat> in fact, one of the one of the things I posted this morning or tried to, I don't think I was successful, but I did one of my blocks for um, who am I when I'm at my best? Okay. Well, my essence is my best. Yep. Now, when we first, um, at the end of writing our essence statement, uh, we, we use our values and your um, principles about life and the things you um, live by and things even that, that trouble you, you know, when things yep. are in the news and something grabs your spirit, you know, we, that all goes into this mix. And um, uh, we had to stand at the front of the class then once we had drafted out our, our essence statement and we had to own it. We yep. had to say it in front of this class of about 20 uh, people. And it choked a lot of us up because it was like, it was des de describing our soul. Yep. And nobody had ever asked us to do that before. Yeah. And um, I, I know I, I choked up and kind of had to start over because it was, it was so precious that somebody would want to know that. And yeah. now I knew it. And, you know, the power of that started from there. And you might, people often think, well, I am precious. Well, why not? I am a precious jewel of wood. I'm the one and only like me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. And I think speaking those words, <clears throat> and I think that's probably what separates it is because when you, you can put all these words together, but when you actually start to put it out and own it and tell it to other people, it is, it, it brings this responsibility. It brings this accountability. So I guess the more you're saying it, you're putting, not saying you're putting pressure on yourself, but you you are, you, you're kind of saying, well, if this is what I'm saying, I've got to kind of start to live up to this, right? And that way, when you're doing things, you're becoming mindful of it and actually naturally putting that action into it, right? And it's interesting because now that we've spoken about it, like I, I didn't even realize this, but I've probably got one myself. Like I wrote something that I wanted to achieve. I think this was back when I was about 14 or 15 and I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, I'll read it out to everyone, but um, I wrote this and I can't even remember why I did, but it was kind of, it was my mission statement. And I want to inspire, be innovative and promote success through all that I do and to the people around me. I wish to spread happiness and express life through my actions. I plan to create opportunity through my visions, dreams, and inspire those around me to aspire further in their own lives. And having done that now, when I reflect back, because <clears throat> this is when I was like, yeah, 13, 14, which, you know, it's almost half my life ago. Now that I think about it, this this podcast, I didn't know this podcast would exist then, but I mean, this is called Further Your Lifestyle. And I, here I am talking about help others aspire further to, you know, and that has helped me probably dictate and, and bring together where I wanted this to be without even realizing it. And yeah, it, it's interesting that we're having this conversation because now I'm trying to think, how did I even bring this to life? When it was kind of just, I remember reading something, you know, what do you want to get out of life? You should write it down and, and things like that. But we do it when we're young and we don't realize, but that's something I've always had. I, you know, share it. I, you know, put it on my website. I put it on all that. And that's what I want to live and stand for. 
It's crazy. Yeah. The, the, I think I first <clears throat> said right at the beginning about how, how potential is, was so sensitive to me as a young person. And, and I've had, I, I think that about that time, I also had this, this uh, like the why was I don't want to stand before God and say, you know, some of that talent you gave me, I buried it. <laughs> Wrong yeah. answer. Yeah. And I don't want anybody else to have that same experience. So um, when, you know, why not have, offer your best to the world and, and the results is you get more satisfaction, more yeah. contentment, because it aligns with how you were created. Yep. There's more joy, freedom, even because you're not you're trying to be what your boss wants you to be. You're being who you are naturally. Yeah, yeah. So look, I mean, it, it's really good, and and something I really want to you know bring open to to conversation is so regardless if you're retired or not, right? If if someone's struggling to find purpose, passion, or their inner spark, you know, we've we've kind of suggested we shouldn't necessarily just wait till we're retired. It's that's more what you're just trying to help people that have gotten there and don't have that spark. But how can anyone, whether it's someone at my age at 30, someone that's 50, 60, or yet to be retired, how how can they, or maybe when they are retired as well, how can one to begin to even find this? Like if there was a couple of points, very high level. How should one start to even look for, well, what is my inner spark? What is my purpose? Because a lot of the time we, we just go do what we think, you know, we've always meant to, oh, my parents were doctors, that's what I'm going to do. Or my parents did this, that's what I'm going to do. My friends tell me I'm good at that, that's what I'll do. But sometimes that's not necessarily what our spark is. We're good at it, but it might not be our passion. So where can one begin to kind of find this at a very high level? Well, a very high level would be to start by asking yourself, uh, to write out 20 things that you like about yourself. Right. And um, I, I kind of think, Chris, that your natural talent may, in fact, quite likely be amongst those 20. And, uh, you know, so often we kind of, oh, poo poo, everybody is able to do that. <laughs> well, no, maybe they're not. Yeah. And um, it, it, and often our, our friends do compliment us on what we're good at. Yeah. Um, I think my, my, uh, well, I, I wouldn't, okay. Another list um, that they, that we use is uh, values yep. and mm, we don't reflect on values all that much, but yeah. uh, my top value I think was um, love and creativity and being responsible. Um, yep. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess diving into that and when you explore, so let's say you've got 20 things, whether it's things that you like to do or that you're passionate about, and then you've got a list of values that kind of overlap. So it, I guess it's about gluing them together and seeing, you know, how can you bring those two together and make a mix of, can you make, take action from one of these? Can you create a service from one of these? Is, is that what we're kind of talking? Well, yeah. Um, at the end of, um, Let's see. No, I was, I was at this, what do I want to do in retirement workshop? I encourage people to, um, you know, have five or six words that you like and um, put them all in a Google search and yep. see what comes up. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, we weren't able to do that 20 years ago. That's and true. Now we can. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's a good way to do it because a lot of the time it really comes down to perspective, right? How we see ourselves and you, you kind of said it before, you know, people will usually tell us what we're good at, but we're kind of like, oh, you know, we don't really embrace it or acknowledge it. But until you really write it down, get into the nitty gritty and, you know, maybe have some real talk with yourself, you start to realize, oh, actually I, I do do this a lot and then start to embrace it because I mean, we're our own worst enemies, right? We, we are so hard on ourselves, but until you kind of get that encouragement and take ownership, it's going to be very hard to actually put these into action. Yeah, and my story about uh, warm memories, um, that would be a really good place to look too. I don't recall how that played a part in writing my essence statement. Um, a little bit, um, the story I always told was um, third grade being a, um, uh, having, being the third reader, or I was the middle reader of three readers. Right. The rest of the class was up on stage doing a choreography <laughs> thing and um 
I thought, well, how do you be a good reader? I'm third grade. I skipped second. So I actually was a second grader. Okay. And I looked around, well, nobody, no, okay, I see. There's a minister up front. What makes him a good minister? Well, he needs to be heard. He needs to speak slowly enough so people can understand him. And he needs to speak loud enough so people yeah. can understand him. And how does a second grader figure that out? <laughs> but then the, the crux of the story is one or two people complimented me. They yeah. noticed the good job I yeah. did. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's a really good way to look at it because when we do reflect back, if you're kind of lost, you know, you've gone through time, and you're trying to think back, well, what am I even good at? Because I get it, you know, people can go through a career of 20 years, you know, they've just done what they've done, but it kind of becomes just routine and you get burnt out and you, you kind of lose everything that you think that you're good at. But reflecting to those warm moments of the things that made you feel special, things that made you feel good, or when, you know, people complimented, I, I think it's, it's beautiful in the some sense that, I mean, we're always, there's that saying of like, out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of children, they, they keep us honest, right? But when you reflect back to your own childhood, what were the simpler times? What were the things that you enjoyed doing? And obviously time changes and they're not all exactly the same things now, but there's moments there which remind you that, oh, actually I was good at this. And then I kind of let it disappear because, you know, you let life get in the way. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I think that's a really good point of reflecting back and thinking what what made you spark when you were a child? What made what gave you that encouragement? What it gave you that curiosity when you were a child? Because a lot of the time, even though it was back then, you can still start to dive into that, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, right? It, it, it's never too late. Well, the, um, another person that does some uh, teaching about purpose in a little different way is, um, is thinking about who do you compliment? that you can't notice the skill it takes to do something um, until you notice it. Yeah. So if, if you, you know, okay, okay, the example for me is I noticed my friend Barbara, um, she was always complimenting teenagers with about their good qualities, you know, bringing yep. out that good quality. And, and um, I, I told people about her often. And then 15, 20 years later, I thought, Oh, I'm kind of doing that same thing now. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed it and therefore I became it. I embraced that. So what do you, who do you want to be like? Yeah. Also hold some, some um, wisdom or value, yeah. valuable data. Well, it's like how you said about, you know, looking at the, you know, if that was it the minister or whoever was talking, you know, you started to see the different traits that they needed to be even though you might not be able to comprehend that as such, you know, in grade two or grade three, but it's something to aspire towards. It's something to say, oh, this is what he did. And as you get older, you, obviously you can articulate it better. You can understand it better. You can fathom it better. And then you can realize, oh, well, he spoke louder. He was able to draw in his audience. He was able to capture, you know, and then you can start to realize, oh, that's what I need to do. And I guess, if anything, yeah, it, it's like, you know, whether it's heroes or influences or people in time that we reflect upon or look up to, because it's like, well, this is what they did. And this is why it worked. That's, that's what I want to be like. And you can start to, you know, pull apart the little pieces that help you grow into that. It's, um, it really is simple when you think about it in that sense. It's, <laughs> it's more about helping people know maybe what they just need to do. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, paying a little attention to the news guy on tv and it seems like i had a third uh, teachers i guess you know being there in front of people you you'd have your students have to hear you they have to be able to understand you and they have to be able to um you speak loud enough yeah. that you're heard yeah but okay. i want to point out something to maybe your younger audience chris yeah. is yeah. that if you see your parents who are retired being stuck have them consider some of these same things we're talking about you might be the neutral third party to mm. asking questions that get them more happiness and joy and um yeah yeah because oftentimes we're too close to our talent mm -hmm. you know our natural abilities and we forget them oh i i've done that. i did that a long time ago well yep. you you might be good at it. So uh, asking probing questions of your parents may help them get unstuck. And um, uh, let's see here, uh, like, what is their passion? 
Yeah. Um, because that often inspires the rest of us, like yeah. even paying attention to who does your parents compliment? Yeah, now it's, it's a good point. And I, and I think, look, passion and purpose, it, I mean, they're very big statements that can be a bit overwhelming, especially, you know, as a kid or when you're growing up, you talk about passion and purpose, it's like, oh, it's scary stuff. But I think as we as we get older, me, you know, I'm about to turn 30 and I remember it was probably about when I was turning 25, you know, I had all these goals, aspirations. This is the purpose, this is the passion I wanted to be. And, you know, all of a sudden there was all this pressure. I'm like, well, I haven't achieved this. I haven't done that. And it's like, oh, was I not good enough? Or did I not tap into my purpose or, or whatever it may be? So I feel like it's overwhelming regardless wherever you are in whatever stage you are in, in life, right? And I think that can be co- become because of, you know, whether it's the pressures of, society everything that we see it's maybe our upbringings or the influences from others but I guess what while we're, we're touching on that and I know we we kind of spoke about it when we first caught up but it's it's probably comes to do with you know the identity that we we attach ourselves to whether it's a work or a career or a moment in life and you know we we identify ourselves through a purpose and passion but sometimes when that passion or purpose changes or the or the job gets stripped away all of a sudden our, our identity gets stripped away as well, which I know we, we touched on at the start there. So how does one go about managing this? Like rather fitting yourself to like a job or whatnot, is there a, should we maybe start to think about, well, maybe we're not trying to find a job that just works for us, but actually finding a job that's relevant to our passion. Is it, do you think it would make more sense to identify that earlier? And then maybe when you get to retirement, it's not going to be necessarily as hard because you're not having to then find something to fill the passion Well, you just keep doing the passion to whatever makes sense. Yeah, I am so encouraged by the young people I see who don't just want a job. Yeah. They want a job that has meaning to them. And that's kind of the, the what's driving the force of finding your essence is, is finding, um, that thing that matters to you yeah um it, you know in and when you're retired it, it gets you out of bed but to to have a job that energizes you one of my blocks i don't think i have it here today but um uh it's your job should give you energy yeah. give you energy not yeah. take energy <laughs> so um the i think you know i you've probably seen the statement that um uh if you find a job that um, that gives you energy. You never have to work another day in your life. Yeah. If, if you do what you love. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. And and I've harped on that for a while, but, and and this is, you know, this is full transparency. Like I've always been the very positive motivated person. And a lot of the time it, it took me a long time until I actually took action myself is a lot of the talk. Like you talk about it, you say, you know, if you love what you do, you never work another day in your life yet. I was working nine to five, not to say I didn't love my job, but there's elements there, which, you know, if you're not jumping out of bed or springing up, there's that clash between, okay, is this something I'm passionate about? Or is it a job that I'm just happy to do? And, you know, that can get a little controversial. I'm not here to say people that, you know, if you're not happy with your job, that it's not for you because, you know, you have your ups and downs weeks and, you know, things aren't always perfect. But I think what you said, if like, if there isn't that energy there, if there isn't there something to help you grow, to to drive you, to motivate you, um, then it's probably something to, to look into. But don't get confused with, you know, the stress that's potentially motivating you. Because stress, I feel like stress can be one of those things where you're feeling the pressure. So you do the work because you don't want to get in trouble. But that's not necessarily the motivation I'm talking about. I'm talking about you know, you're wanting to do this, it's fulfilling, you're feeling excited, you're willing to take on the challenge, rather than, you know, getting pressured into trying to just meet a deadline, because yeah, you'll be motivated because you're scared of the consequence. But you're more talking about you want people to be embracing it in the sense that like, well, this is a challenge, it's going towards my end goal, it's going towards where I want to be, my purpose, my essence statement. Well, and, you know, life does throw us curves. Um, yeah that you do still need to pay the rent. And, but if you look at a not quite, because I think I, I left a job in, um, I was living in Tampa, Florida at the time. And um, I, I had learned so much about myself. I, um, I knew they weren't paying me for all the talent I had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not 
not sure that was really the best uh, decision. Yeah. Because uh, I, I went into working temp jobs for like 10 years. And, um, <laughs> but, um, but when I started at Boeing, it was during the 2007, 2008 um, economic decline. And um, I had <clears throat> different people every now and then that would stop me because I was working on the production floor. I actually learned how to use power tools. Nice. And um, they say, what are you doing here with a master's degree? Paying the rent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that I can pay the rent. So you go in with a, a, a mindset that I'm in control here. And this is not my dream job, yep. but it's on my way to a dream yeah. job. It's a really good perspective. And I think sometimes we, we can, I, I think you need to have that balance of identifying, well, if you're starting out as a graduate going into career, you're not going to have that dream job, the first job you're doing, because you have to have experience, you have to build into it, you have to, you have to learn, you have to grow. But, you know, also understanding, well, you need to be able to pay bills, you need to have a bit of a roadmap to where you want to go and how that entry may be. Is it working in a cafe just to earn some money to get you while you're studying? That's fine then. Then you can go start that career. Is it taking an internship so you can learn, 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 and maybe you're not necessarily getting the big dollars? Or is it taking that graduate path or more of a corporate path and building your way up the ladder? Or is it starting your own business and learning along the way and however it may be? I, I think it's, it's very important for people to have that understanding. But I think one thing also, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, is not falling victim of, you know, getting comfortable, you know, with the paycheck to paycheck and things like that. Because I think that's that's a lot of the trap that happens is we do, we tend to get comfortable, you're getting a nice salary. So then when there is that opportunity of to follow a passion or a spark or something over there is curious, we're too scared to jump on it. And do you think people you know, they, they skip that because they're scared of the risk. And then that's why when they keep working, that's all they know, they get to retirement and they realize they missed the door, but they missed the opportunity. Yeah, the subtitle to my second podcast series was, it's your time to shine. Yeah. And um, part of what's in this whole conversation, Chris, is that our bosses don't often ask us to work from our heart. Yeah. From our creativity, yes, yes, they want creativity, but um, do they even recognize that it kind of boils up from our heart and our spirits? So um, the big shift when you leave that job that's become monotonous yep. <laughs> is to say, let's wake up our heart and um, there might be some dreams in there and um, who's holding you back now? Yep. Um, one of the little blocks I made, you're the one that stops you. Yeah, correct. Um, I, I went through, I still sometimes think about, I've got a chair right here. And, and if I sat in that chair 24 hours a day, I'd be no less loved and no more loved than doing nothing but sitting yep. and living, you know, in a chair. So what I do doesn't add value to me. Yeah. Now, it may definitely add things to my spirit that accomplish something. I matter to somebody. Yeah. I made a difference in somebody's life. So um, it's, it's, I think, I, I keep wondering if, if that's harder for men to do than women. What do you think? Um, I, look, it's, I, I think it's, it might not be as simple as separating, but I think we all think differently in that sense. And, you know, sometimes it is about, you know, men are driven by maybe power and money traditionally, or they want to have yeah. ownership and they, they want to be able to support their family or, or whatever. Whereas, you know, women do come from that creativity side, they're more emotional and, you know, they probably play the longer game or they're more resilient and very patient. Whereas men aren't, we're not patient, right? We, we kind of just want things now. And I think that there is that, that struggle between that, but I think it is also changing. Like, I think now that I look back with, with all the opportunity that's available, it doesn't kind there isn't that separation as much, you know, I mean, obviously there's still a lot of debate and struggle around, you know, is there differences between men and women in the workforce and whatnot. But when you strip that away and you think about, well, as an individual to be creative, you know, how many people are starting a podcast? How many people are starting a YouTube channel? How many people are creating something from scratch and being creative, whether they're male or female. Right. And I think, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that, that didn't exist, right? You know, there was, you know, there was the outliers, but traditionally it was kind of like, 
there's the people just building up in their nine to five in their, you know, in their workforce, but now they don't have to, they don't have to depend on, you know, the man or the, the boss, we can be our own boss so early. Um, and I think that creative spirit is, it, it can be awakened a lot quicker than us, you know, to waiting 20, 30 years. I think this pandemic might have wakened up a lot 100%. of creativity. Silver lining. Yeah. I, I think it's, you know, in some sense, it's forced us to have to think differently to pivot and adjust, um, which by all means, I'm not saying that it's really good that we've had the pandemic, but I think for some people, it's probably changed their lives for the better, right? Because they've had to, they've, they've lost the job, they've had to jump in to do something else, or they've had to fall back onto their passions or talents. Well, I'm good at this. I'll, I'll just start recording or I'll, I'll start documenting or I'll start creating this or helping other people. And, you know, if they had never been pushed into that circumstance, it probably never would have happened or it might've, you know, they might've had to wait 20, 30 years, which is very sad, but a lot of the time it does require some friction or big moment of change to happen unless you're willing to rip that bandaid off yourself. Well, and I have a friend that has actually used uh, the essence statement process with um, kids that were in, in kindergarten, first grade that were acting out a lot. Okay. I, I'm not sure, to, in my mind, I, I don't recall how she described the results, but to me, it would, it would be kids that are frustrated and don't feel heard or don't feel, uh, feel a lot different than everybody else. When they realize that they're uniquely made and kids won't understand them, and that's okay. Yeah. As long as I understand me, I think I could maybe settle down a little bit. Yeah, that, that is true. I think stepping in and it's, it's crazy because in the last, you know, six months to a year of myself, you know, I've learned so much more about myself, right? And, you know, I've been, I've been working for, for eight years, but you learn so much more when you're, you know, you embrace and take a chance on yourself because the only person I can rely on is me. I don't have anyone else to work for me building this podcast. It's not like someone is saying, are you releasing an episode this week? I've set the expectation. I've set up. So, I have to live up to that. And when doing that, you have to realize, you know, am I being too hard on myself? Do I need to embrace something different? I'm learning other things about, you know, the hobbies, the things that I enjoy to do because I've got more time to do it, right? And I think it's important that whether you're, when you're younger, when you're older, whatever, but you need to, you need to, when there is that curiosity or something sparks out is understand it don't just try to ignore it I was like oh I don't know what that is about me I'll just you know let it you know you you people usually tend to just sink it down and you know put it away but if you spend a little bit of time and invest that curiosity you're potentially going to chip away better at that spark or passion to make it into whatever it should be yeah I do a lot of um what's possible questions in my book ah. uh, fresh courage in retirement because um if you get curious like a three-year-old, you know, if a three-year-old wants to open a door, they will figure yeah, it out. Yeah. <laughs> if they want to, um, you know, turn on the faucet, boy, they'll climb up four different ways to get to the yeah. faucet. So uh, what's possible is really, um, it's that, like you say, a mind-bending thing. It stretches what's, um, what, how we see things. So yeah. Um, I think it keeps us younger. I've often said that um, problems in learning and and thinking a different way keeps me young. And people don't believe that I'm 73, but I am. Uh, hey, in a couple months, I'll be 74. Wow. So um, Still young. It looks good on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's, it's interesting how, <clears throat> you know, as we progress older, we do, we tend to reflect back to, childhood right you kind of said you know what are the possibilities and we do we reflect back to well if a kid was in this situation it, it's kind of like you break it down to that st statement of kiss keep it simple stupid you know like what would a kid do in this situation it's like oh well they would try and open the door they would push it this way they would you know bang it and, and that's what they do but as adults we tend to oh we don't we don't want to cause any problem we're, we're too scared to open the door or push it this way and and that's because we we get so I guess narrow minded from everything around us, and it's it's weird to think that because imagine not to say we should always be childlike because obviously there needs to be some level of maturity as we as we get older, but if we kept some level of child curiosity as we progress over the 20, 30, 40 years, 
the difference that it would make, um, you know, not just for us, but for the people around us and, you know, the potential that we can create. Well, here's a place that you might find uh, some interesting reflection on is Fresh Courage term came to me um, in a Hallmark movie. I love Hallmark <laughs> movies. And this line said, um, when people go home from vacation, they often go home with fresh courage. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I remember that happening to me. Or when you're out watching the, the ocean, you know, or a lake or something, and um, yeah. uh, uh, you'll have a flash of insight. And, and, you know, like, where did that come from? Well, maybe it's a message to your spirit of what might be possible. <laughs> That's it. A hundred percent. Look, this is great. I want to, I want to ask you a question, which, um, and, and we're going to jump into some rapid fire questions shortly, but this, this other question, which is a bit more of just around that summarizing that whole, you know, conversation that we've just had is if you knew what you knew now, but like you were starting out, you know, a career or looking at what you wanted to do in life what would be your advice? Like, how would you approach it? You, you've gone back, you're going back to early 20s, you got everything ahead of you. If you knew what you knew now, how would you tackle it? What would, what would, what would your advice be? Well, I do remember, um, like when I quit that job in Tampa, Florida, um, I took, you know, temp jobs to pay the rent. Yeah. But there's, there's part of me that wished I had the courage then to um, hang on for dear life, no matter what the price of the cost. Because um, there's another time that I, uh, that I lived off of credit cards. Boy, is that a mistake. <laughs> it takes a long time to get back out of that. But to um, like do or die, I'm going to go this direction. And yeah and wished I had hung on for dear life more yeah. and, and taking that risk. I've always known I was a good risk, but to have the um, patience for God to work it out in yeah. my, on my behalf was something I wished I had done differently. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's, I appreciate you saying that because I think sometimes we get so scared of, oh, it's going to take me two years, yet we then get stuck in something else for 20 years. Like meaning, you know, we're too scared to take two years to invest and, you know, take a chance, take a risk, you know, maybe have to live it a bit rough because, you know, you have to pay the bills, whatever. And then everything will come after that. But then we're so comfortable of living comfortable for 20 years, but not never actually living at our potential. Uh, and what you just said there really, I think really will hit a lot of people, you know, wake them up and, and really challenge them. It has for me as well. And I appreciate you sharing that. I want to jump into some rapid fire questions just to get to know a bit more for the audience. And just, they're just a bunch of random things. Um, you can answer really short and sharp, or if there is some points of value you want to add, then by all means, please. But the first one being, what is your favorite book you have read? Oh man, that's, that's a hard one. Let me, let me mention the one that made the most difference to me right yep. when I was uh, retiring was, um, the joy diet in fact i just got myself okay. my own copy because i often borrow things from the library but the joy diet talks about 10 menu items and the first menu item is <laughs> nothing spend 15 to 20 minutes daily doing nothing yep and what it did for me was oh there's a small voice inside that will talk to me if yep. i listen yeah no, it's, so it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Inside wisdom. Uh huh. Yeah, no, that's great. And the, the next one, which is, is actually a good segue then is the biggest lesson that you have learned. Well, uh, hmm. the, I guess when I left Seattle, I transferred with my job to uh, Tampa, Florida. And I had had a sense for two, three years that I was going to be leaving here. And um, I kind of started looking around, what would I miss? And um, I decided seagulls. Well, there are seagulls in Tampa, but not quite the same as what's here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the whole, I mean, the moving clear across the country, a lot of people would not go there. Yeah. I have to leave all my friends and all that. Well, I guess I may not be all that tied 
you know, close knit to my friends, but there's such a maturity process of going to someplace you've never lived before. And I would go into work and ask, I, if I need this item, what store do I go to here? Yep. You know, if I want an insurance agent, where do I find a good insurance agent? So that being vulnerable and um, the maturing process is just amazing when you yeah. um, step into the unknown. Now that, that's so good. It's so relevant. It's so relevant. Um, any, <laughs> any regrets that you've had to live with or if there was one regret that you've got, or maybe you don't have any? Well... Uh, I guess I don't, well, like um, the mint, the living off of credit cards was kind of a regret, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, since I've never married, I it's, see, it's never been important to me to have kids where my younger sister, she, that was all she wanted out of life was a yeah. family. Um, I have always wanted to be married, but there's, no, I haven't always gone pursuing, um, <laughs> because my last couple of dates were a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. um, I, I am interested in um, ha- sharing my life with someone in this uh, season now. And um, so I don't exactly regret that because I could have done something more, I guess, yep. in that regard. But um, it, uh, you know, it just makes retirement really different and a little more of a challenge. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate you sharing that. That's that's really nice of you. Uh, when you're not helping others, like pursuing, you know, in your coaching and helping people in retirement and all that jazz, what what do you like to do in your leisure time? Like, you know, what when you like to have some time off and, and just relax, what what do you like to do? Well, <laughs> I don't do much of that, I guess. Um, I make a point to daily do a walk of about a mile. And um, I watch the squirrels and the crows and the... Um, bunny rabbits around our area (laughs) and um and pet the dogs that that delights me but um i have an ocean right here about a mile away so that's quite yeah quite nice and um the the mount baker and mount rainier are close by within uh two or three hours so um i understand the japanese they they actually prescribe you to have forest time to rejuvenate yep. your spirit and um there's actually a walking trail about a couple miles away that i have done that a time or two but um i guess uh well i quilt so my dream my dream vacations would be uh doing a hot air balloon ride or doing a quilt show or um there's an art fair in california i'd like to go to Nice. No, that's great. I mean, very creative elements as well there. And I, I agree, getting out in the outdoors, just enjoying the peace and quiet. It, it is, it's rejuvenating. It, it's lovely. It's relaxing and, and, and calming. All right, the, the last one I had for you then is the favorite place that you have ever been to. Well, Australia comes close because body surfing in um, Gold Coast was I've never been drunk, but boy, that body surfing <laughs> reminded me of what I might feel if I was <laughs> drunk. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of another place that um, my favorite place, Lake Tahoe is pretty nice, okay. but I haven't spent much time there either. So um, the water and mountains and um, moon are Oh, lovely. It sounds like you really do like the outdoors and, and you love just the, the simple things in the outdoors, right? You know, which, because a lot of the time, you know, we do, we think about, we have to go far, but you know, a lot of the time you were saying just enjoying down at the beach, just the nice little walk. And it is, it's sometimes the simple things of watching squirrels or bunnies. And every time I go for a run, I, I love just seeing the birds or whatnot. And because I feel like they're just coming to say hi and, you know, we've got cows and things around us and, but each one, it, it's not, it's like a nice little moment just to enjoy. I actually had a friend at, at Boeing that fed a couple of crows every morning and his coworkers thought he was crazy, but those crows knew him. Yeah. And a couple of the dogs lately that they've been pulling their masters because they recognized me yeah. and they knew me. It's so good. It's so good. It's like you've got that little whisper in their ear, but it is, it's lovely, right? Because then when you go out, you just have that little moment of remembrance that, you know, it's, it is, it's kind of like a social moment as well. Right. And it's, it's very cute. And 
I, I secretly think that as well, that there's certain birds that I see all the time and I think they know me because I see them looking at me, right? And they don't fly away, whereas others will, right? It's it's not yeah, all in so my I head. Always- <laughs> at the crows i think you know me here i am <laughs> yeah that's it that's it oh uh, well look, look sharon this is this has been wonderful and i appreciate you taking the time we're, we're, we've touched on so many different things here and i think for me you know it's what i've taken away so much from this is you know like we shouldn't be waiting till we're retired to we then be spending time to finding our passions and dreams and goals and i know that's what you're trying to help people do is achieve you know to try and find those so they're not waiting until they're retired but also helping those that have potentially missed out in in making that happen before retiring right and what i wanted to give you the chance to do is if there was anything to leave the audience with as a takeaway or a piece of advice if it was one thing that they would take away from this conversation what would you want that to be well what was coming to mind as you were talking was um how i've been kind of focusing the last year on loving myself <clears throat> and i know all through my you know not having been married i Oh, to be cherished, to be cherished. And one morning I I could cherish myself. Yeah. <laughs> How novel of an idea. Yeah. But um uh what's what's come of that seems like other people are noticing that I'm loving myself. Yeah. And to and to know and and uh, uh, recognize your shine, it's your time to shine. You have to recognize your shine first. Yeah. No, but it's, it's very true, right? And I think it, it, everything that we've spoken about is understanding who you are, embracing it, understand the things that make you curious, the things that make you passionate, the things that make you feel like you have purpose. It, it all really does come back because if you don't know yourself first, how are you even going to execute those things? How are you going to bring them into practice? So it, that's re- really, I really do appreciate you sharing that. So where, where is the best place for people to to follow you, to follow along, see what, you know, the latest things okay. coming? Because I know you just released a book as well. Yeah. And um, I think how I met you was on Instagram. I haven't been out there long and I still don't know all the ins and outs, but I am <laughs> called the queen of cur- courage. I took a class with Forbes Riley recently and she asked everybody, what, what are you known for? Well, uh, since I have a courage book. Yeah. I'm the queen of courage and um and now I'm I'm um doing starting to hold up just my little things and I talk just a couple minutes about how is living your passion calling on your courage how can you be courageous today to live from your passion so uh, my book you can order on freshcouragebook.now n-o-w dot site s-i-t-e it's available on Amazon. And if you order there, you can also do a review. Nice. The paper copy isn't quite um, ready. I got to notice today that the lamination process has had some kind of holdup, but the Kindle is available. Oh, beautiful. And um, the, the words and beauty going together somehow process differently in our brain. And so I included about 10 or 12 of these art blocks in my book to inspire you yeah. in, a, in a different way. And they are for sale on Etsy in the Quilted Petunia Ooh, store. Nice, nice. And um, my, my business uh, on Facebook is called Effortless Vitality. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah, Effortless Vitality. Oh, and I and I I do have a fresh courage in retirement page um, all set up, and I'll probably be starting a group for fresh courage okay. coaching in the near future. Awesome. Well, lots is happening, but for anyone that's listening, all of this will be in the show notes as well, so people can jump down and click through, and whether it's on the YouTube version or for, whether it's on Spotify or just the the audio versions, but. Sharon, I, I appreciate this so much because I've learned a lot from this and I, and I know you've enjoyed yourself as well. And there's so much more that I think people can take from this because, you know, it's whether people are retired or looking to retire or, you know, nowhere near retirement. I think having a conversation with you, there's, there's probably a lot that people can take away from it. So if anyone does have more questions, by sure, reach out to Sharon, have a conversation and, and get in contact because I, I think, you know, there's a whole lot of wisdom here. Uh, you've, you've been through a lot. You've gone through the journey. And obviously, you're, you're still young, still got plenty of time to, you know, achieve different things that you want to achieve, but help other people achieve it too. I've only met 
uh, are found on the internet, maybe two or three other people that do this kind of work. Maybe. There's several people tossing the word essence around, but who teaches it? Yeah. You gotta come see me. <laughs> That's it. Well, you've heard it here first, people. Um, I really appreciate you dropping by, Sharon. It's been an absolute honor to have you here. And um, yeah, anyone reach out to Sharon, please do. And to everyone else, cheers. Well, there you go, guys. What an awesome episode and how cool is Sharon? And what I took away from this episode the most was helping find yourself in a position where you're not just trying to work for the sake of working, but you're working which is identifying close to your passion and close to your purpose and bringing those two world as close together as early as possible. Of course, sometimes it's not always going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen in your first job or in your first gig that you're looking to do. But over time, making sure that you are working towards that roadmap, or I guess that North Star that fits you into that position of where you're going to be the most successful because you're riding out your purpose. You're riding out your passion. Of course, this is a journey, right? And not everything is going to be a perfect fit for everyone right at this time or right at that moment. And I encourage you to, to take away from this episode something that's going to encourage you to go think a little deeper, think a little different, or maybe find a fresh perspective in all that you're doing. And I do encourage you that, and I, and I completely understand that sometimes hearing these messages around, you know, go finding your purpose or finding your passion can be a bit cliche. It can be a bit overwhelming to hear. And I encourage you to, you know, make sure you are just taking some notes, taking some reflection time to really think about, are you doing what you love? Are you doing that, what you're passionate about? And how can you, if you're not, how can you find a way to start to bring that back into your life, start to bring that back into wherever you're working. Now, at the same time, maybe you are passionate about what you're doing. Maybe you do feel like you have purpose and that is great. And I want to encourage you, continue to ride that path, continue to drive it out and help others see how they can do it too. So Sharon, I really do appreciate you coming onto the, onto the podcast and everyone, I encourage you to go check out her content, go check out her new book that she's just released as well. And of course you can find all the details in the description below and the show notes. My name's Chris Ferlong. I'm your host and it's been an absolute honor to be able to bridge this conversation between you and Sharon. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Cheers. Now, if you didn't know, we do have the podcast merch, and this is with a key focus of enamel pins. Now, if you haven't checked these out, make sure you do, because the intent of these are really just to be a small token and a reminder for you to charge on, to push on, and to further your lifestyle, uh, whether it is a gift for someone else to encourage them or maybe to inspire them, or maybe it's a way to motivate yourself, or you can simply just make a purchase to simply support the podcast, which would be greatly appreciated. We do also have some sweaters and some long tees, so make sure you check it out. Link in the description and in the show notes. Really do appreciate it. Cheers.